This is episode number 92 featuring artist Susie Baker, and it's going to be a good one for you. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. This podcast is brought to you by the 2019 Plein Air Convention and Expo. Joseph McGurl, one of the most highly respected landscape artists in America, is going to be there on stage teaching, but also doing a pre-convention workshop. The Art Renewal Center says that he's a living master. An opportunity to study under this guy in this event is a great opportunity. It's going to be at the April 2019 Plein Air Convention in San Francisco, plus wine country. He's going to be teaching this pre-convention workshop the day before and part of the day before the event opens. And it's just great. These pre-convention workshops are a great way to learn. If you're not already planning to attend the Plein Air Convention, this is a great time to register and save because, quite frankly, the price is going to go up here pretty soon. Uh, we sold a ton of seats already. And San Francisco is going to be one of the most popular locations because there's so much to paint there. I used to live out there, so I know all the great paint spots. But we're going to paint, imagine painting the Golden Gate Bridge. This is going to be a lifetime experience. And we just know all the great spots. We're going to go out to wine country, paint out there. It's going to be really fun. So come and meet Joe, a study under Joe in the pre-convention workshop. And take a look at our lineup of amazing painters. And by the way, there's just so many more that we have invitations out to that are going to be coming and being announced. So check it out at plenairconvention.com. Also, underwritten by Fall Color Week, it's my paint camp coming up in October. A chance to paint fall color, roll out of bed every morning, have your meals served to you, paint a couple pieces a day. No competition or show, just paint with friends, laugh a lot, do music at night, sit up, have fun. You deserve this. I do it because I deserve it. And so I want you to come along with me. This year, we're doing Fall Color Week in the amazing Canadian Rockies. You're going to need a passport, so go ahead and apply now. Canadian Rockies, including visits to Banff and Lake Louise. John Singer Sargent painted some amazing paintings up there. It's a ball. Scott Christensen was telling me about some of those the other day. Anyway, we all become very close. We're going to spend a week together and have some real fun. So I hope you'll join us. Visit fallcolorweek.com to sign up or learn more. After today's interview, I'm going to be answering questions about marketing your art in the Marketing Minute. But first, let's get to this interview with Susie Baker. Well, I'm honored today to have Susie Baker on with us. Susie, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. Well, you're a real trooper because at the time we're recording this, you are where? I am at my host home in Easton, Maryland, having just turned in my uh, top two pieces and all of the paintings that I've done from the week. So now I'm feeling a little relaxed. Um, and so you're at the Easton. Taking this opportunity to talk to you. You're at the Easton Plein Air event. So um, we won't know the results. We don't know how you did. We won't know how you sold or if you got any prizes. But it'll be fun to uh, to find that out in the future. Right. I look forward to finding out myself. So you know, what's, th- these events, I, I always kind of feel good about my work, and then I walk in and I see everyone else's, and I'm gobsmacked. And, <laughs> um, you know, you just do your best, and uh, it's like a little master class when you walk in and, and see how all the other artists solved the, the same problems you had with the same um, raw material of their, of their ability and, you know, and the view. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the great lessons is the the importance of painting with other people and and uh, the idea of of seeing how other people interpret things. When we do these uh, publishers invitational events like the Adirondacks and Fall Color Week and stuff, there are a lot of people who come to those who have not got the privilege of being in a show like Easton, for instance. 
and they don't get the chance to paint with other people. And so you get to see all these different interpretations. It's really kind of fun. Right. And it's, um, you know, and when those people whose easel you're looking over the shoulder of are, you know, just great <laughs> national artists, then they really are like little master classes. You know, you see technique. It, you know, it's, it almost feels a little bit like cheating. Like I'm not having to take their workshop, but I'm learning a lot from them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're having a pretty busy year. Um, you're kind of one of these people who's an overnight success, except you've, it's not really overnight, but it kind of feels like it. You're, you're doing a lot of shows this year. You're at, at Easton right now uh, and doing a lot of others. Is that right? I, I am. I sort of signed up and applied for my usual ones that I had been doing, and then I got invitations to others. And, um, you know, you just – I sort of made a habit of when a door got open, I'd sort of walk through it. And I think probably next year I'll have uh, – I'll be a little more selective. But um, – it, and it's, it's a little bit of a challenge in that I need to – you know, take care of myself, and um, I'm doing, I think, 14 plein air events this year. Are you really? Yeah. That's a lot. I, it is, and it seems even a little crazy to me, but, um, you know, last year I did three events and a workshop um, and taught a workshop sort of back to back to back, and that was sort of my um, my practice on, okay, can I do these and be healthy at the end of it and not be burnout and and um so I would make sure that I was you know taking care of myself and eating well and getting the rest that I needed and and just monitoring my stress you know <laughs> and letting myself sort of breathe and um and and I you know another thing about doing so many events is you get a lot of painting done and when you paint a lot you get better yeah. you know and so I would say that would be one of the pros of having a busy schedule. Uh, of course, there's a lot of of cons as well. So <laughs> well, when you're at, when you're at home, you've got so many other distractions that even if you're a professional painter, you're not necessarily out painting a couple of paintings a day. Uh, so these events kind of force you into that. That's that's right. There's not the laundry to do, and um, I tend to do kind of triage on my inbox. Uh, my email inbox and do what's necessary and um you know i'm not watching netflix and um put, putzing around in the kitchen i'm just sort of <laughs> i'm working and and painting a lot so it's uh it's it's a good opportunity really so how did this um uh, painting full-time thing happen to you well i um we can go back a little bit. I majored in advertising and fine arts at Louisiana Tech University and um, had a really great program, um, almost accidentally. You know, my, my kids are college age now, and the amount of effort that we put into researching and getting them into college and that they do is Herculean compared to what I did. And, and I just got lucky and got a, some great teachers um, and that I majored in advertising, graphic design, because that's my pragmatic streak. And I wanted a job that had benefits and paid. But uh, I also had great oil painting instruction. Um, a wonderful teacher, Peter Jones, had us painting outdoors, um, you know, looking at color and light, um, you know, painting from life, uh, doing outdoor painting. We didn't call it plein air painting back then. Um, I had my grandmother's paint box and I sat on the ground with a blanket and wore sunscreen and you know didn't have an umbrella and all the accoutrement but but still painted outdoors. So I I've always, you know, since even I was a teenager painted outdoors um but worked as a designer, art director and then um in 2008 my husband's job brought us overseas to the Middle East and that was a reset button in my life. You know, it's amazing when you fly across the ocean and a sea and are in a, a you know, eight hour different time zone that you can set down all of the things that you had agreed to and pick up those things that are most important to you. You know, my um, family and 
um, our church and our family relationship. And, and then for me, it was art. And so I, you know, sort of did as little graphic design as possible for the clients that I still had. And, and then just started painting and, um, and planning painting trips with other women. I went to India with some other women and, and that was how I sort of painted outdoors. And then that was 2008. And when we got back to the United States in 2010, I wanted to carry on, you know, making these trips with other artists and invited a friend of mine, Susan Hotard to, um, go out to California and stay with my brother and paint at the Huntington Arboretum and out in Laguna. And when I was out in Laguna Beach, I saw a flyer for the Laguna Beach Plain Air Invitational, and I was like, what is this, and how do I do this? You know, it was it was a total revelation to me, and I had no idea that thing existed. But We have that so in common, began, because the first time I ever learned about anything such as a plein air show was also in Laguna. Yeah, well, yeah. it's it's one of the biggies, you know, it's, yeah, and... Well, it's 20, 20 years it. old this year, and um, right. long before yeah. I started the magazine, I just kind of discovered it and uh, happened to be in town as a tourist that weekend. Right. It's great, isn't it? And yep. then, yeah, and then you're looking over the shoulder of Ray Roberts and John Cosby and, you know, Peggy and just all of these tremendous artists. And, you know, it raises your bar. You see where that bar is. And, and think, okay, what's between me and that bar, and how do I get there? And um, it's really fortunate. I'm, I'm fortunate to have participated in that event. So and, that uh, that event then led you to painting full time. Uh, well, I had already decided I would be painting full time, and and just seeing that flyer got me researching it. That was in 2010, and uh, the very first plein air event that I applied to and got in was Telluride plein air in um, 2014. And so this is a, a story to promote the plein air convention because I, I got in that event and I thought I, I need to understand how these events work. And so I signed up for the 2014 spring plein air convention in Monterey and I went out there prepared with my uh, business card and a portfolio of my work lo- loaded on my iPad. And um, the first session I went to was a breakout session that was meant for um, for plein air planners. And I thought, well, if I go to that, then I can hear what they're saying and, and sort of learn the ropes. And, and it just so happened that Rosemary Schwimm was on the the panel and she is the director of Laguna. Well, I perked up because I thought, Oh, Laguna, I want to, how do I get into that one? And, um, <laughs> and the funny story is, is she said, well, you know, we have a list of a couple hundred artists. We narrow it down to a hundred and then we pick about 36. <laughs> and I wrote those numbers down and I wrote "Phew!" exclamation point, And I sort of tilted my notepad up to the lady sitting next to me who happened to be Lynn Vale. And she said, well, I'm her um, assistant. (laughs) And I said, well, here's my business card. And (laughs) wouldn't you like to see my portfolio? And, and, um, and she said she would. And then later in the convention, I got an invitation to do Laguna, which to me at the time felt like I was an Olympic walk on, you know, like I'm the agony of defeat guy at the top of the hill thinking, I'm pretty sure I can do this, you know? (laughs) <laughs> so my my second plein air event was Laguna, and uh, so I just pretended like I belonged there, and, um, and and my main goal that year was just don't embarrass myself. So I think I did okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's terrific. So you've been doing now. That's been since 2014. So you've been doing a lot of events mm-hmm. since then. What is it like being on the road? and doing 14 events a year? Well, it's, um, it takes a lot of planning, um, which is that's the part that I find most stressful, you know, making sure that I have the frames and the panels and I understand the nuanced rules of a particular event, um, size limitations and expectations. And, and then of course, if I'm flying, um, booking the flight (laughs) one time, 
I had thought so hard about booking my flight to Laguna. I had filed it in my mental, I had done that category. And then when I, a couple of weeks before the event, when I, I looked to see when, you know, when my flight was, lo and behold, I hadn't actually booked it. I only just thought really hard about it. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm not usually that scatterbrained, but I, you know, doing a lot of events requires a lot of planning. And, um, so I've, I've come up with techniques to, to try to keep myself in line, but, um, you know, calendars and, um, reminders and, uh, you know, all of those things we do. And then, and then of course, once you've done an event, you need to make sure you photograph those things that you've archived and cataloged those things and marked, you know, who, what sold and to who and get those people on your mailing list and write thank you notes. It's, um, there's a good deal to do. So I, I try to do as much of that before the end of the event so that when I move on to the next one, I am, it's sort of behind me. Got a system um, down, huh? I try. I try. Um, so talk to me about uh, teaching. Are you doing much teaching? <laughs> I, I do teach. I really enjoy teaching. I, um, I had such good teachers in college that it, it, it feels like a pay it forward opportunity as well as, you know, a part of me as a business person and my business plan. Um, but it's I enjoy... Interesting. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, it's very mm-hmm. rare that I hear an artist refer to themselves as a business person. Talk to me about that. Well, you are. I mean, you're, you're a small business, you know, and, um, and, and, and the busier that I get, the more I recognize that there are, you know, there's two things that only I can do. I can all, I'm the only one that can paint my paintings, and I'm the only one that can teach uh, my workshops. And there's a whole lot of other things that um, I can I can have other people do. And I'm, I'm definitely at that tipping point where it makes more sense to have someone else to do um, my bookkeeping and um some keeping up with collectors and, and things like that. So I have been, um, yeah, I, I think it's helpful to think of yourself as, as a business person because there is a whole marketing sales um, part of what we do that's that's actually very important. I mean, I want to be painting paintings, and if I'm getting invited to shows and into gallery shows, then those things are sort of setting hurdles for me to jump over and make more paintings. So it, it's hard to get in a, it, it's hard to not have something to paint when you have all of these sort of goals and things ahead of you. So, so um, talk to me about teaching. We were talking about that before I distracted you. Um, what, what, you. You do a lot of workshops how, how do you determine if, you know, what, what makes like a good workshop student? Well, I, I think the best students are the ones that come um, a little bit prepared, um, even if they're novice. Like I, I get asked, you know, I, I'm totally new to painting. Would your workshop be good for me? I will say, I will say yes. However, if you had um, a good foundation of drawing and some color knowledge, you would get a great more out of the workshop. Um, you know, if, if you haven't opened your oil paint or your box, I would suggest that you sort of get out and sort of whack your brushes against the problems because then when you come into not just my workshop but anybody's workshop and you have a certain fund of knowledge um, about your equipment, about your um, drawing, about um, mixing some color and paint, um, maybe you, you assigned yourself the the task of doing the color charts that Richard Schmidt outlines in his book and, and other people, you can find them online. You know, you will have prepared yourself for a, a much better experience than anybody's workshop. Um, you know, it, it, the only way to learn to paint is to paint. Like we can give you lots of technique techniques and tips and you can watch great demos, but apart from just getting out and, you know, feeling the tactile nature of paint and, and, and actually just making lots and lots of mistakes. Um, 
you know, you, you really, when you do get the answers in a, in a workshop or you see someone else doing it, but that lesson just lands home so well, much you're, more. You're throwing your money away to some extent if you're, if you're trying to l- figure out those things when you're around a, you know, a, a very accomplished artist who can teach you how to get to a higher level. So you certainly want to have that stuff under control. And, and I've been to workshops. I'm sure you've had people in workshops who, like you say, that it's like, well, I've never used the easel. I've never cracked this paint open. <laughs> right. uh, it's first time. Right, right. Yeah, and, and I mean, they will learn something, um, but just probably not as much if, if they hadn't already had some, some experience. And, you know, so many workshop students are, um, they've had careers and other things, and they're very accomplished um, teachers, doctors, lawyers, and they're, they're very anxious, like, okay, they've, they've put this off long enough, and they're just really... Um, finally getting to a place where they're they're doing something that is at their core and that's their art and so i understand the um the drive to just jump right into you know an oil painting workshop where you have a sort of a full complement of colors and um but but you know when when i was in school we had drawing 101 and color theory and design and composition you know, all before we even got into um, into oil painting. And even in my first oil painting class, we did grisaille um, paintings and sort of burnt sienna and, and, you know, and that's it, like sort of value studies in one color before we started moving into more. So I understand the temptation to sort of want to jump right in, but if, if you do sort of assign yourself a more incremental approach of... Um, you know, if, if anybody's listened to your podcast very much and you have asked artists, you know, what do they recommend? You know, almost to a person, it's it's drawing, it's understanding values, it's, um, you know, some basic color theory and, and drawing, drawing, drawing. Um, because if you, if you can draw well, then you don't limit yourself as to what subject matter you might paint. Um, because... You know, you begin looking at things, whether it's a human figure or a glass jar with flowers in it or a, a landscape is just shape and form and value um, as opposed to, I don't know how to draw a blah, blah, you know. <laughs> so. How do you draw a blah, blah? Uh, do we, they're very <laughs> difficult, actually, surprisingly. <laughs> so um, when we were prepping, Prepping for this, uh, you talked about tabletop questions and uh, the plein air movement. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so I, I'm i on the board with Oil Painters of America, and I go to enough conventions where you find yourself at a, a dinner table with eight to ten people, and, and um, I got in the habit of sort of asking an icebreaker question, like a tabletop question, where we all sort of go around and answer that question, and and listen to one another, and it's been a real nice way to get to know people beyond the surface. And uh, questions in the past have been, uh, you know, what would you, what would your adult self tell your teenage self? That made some really interesting conversations. And but the most recent one um, is, what was your first art memory? And it's really been it's really been fascinating, you know, how typically it's a table of artists. And those art memories are very young. You know, some some people sharing crib memories that they even feel a little dubious about whether it's <laughs> an actual memory or something they came up with. But um, you know, elementary school. It another thing that's kind of funny is the number of times people talked about stealing ideas from other people when or or sort of cheating. <laughs> and I think I think we still steal ideas from each other. You know that the best ideas are from the easel next to you. But, um, but in one of the tabletop conversations where we were sitting around, um, it, it was brought up. We wonder if this were a group of non artists, what would they say? Um, you know, would their memories be much later? I, I asked my husband this and his, um, early art memory was meeting me in college and, going to galleries and thinking of art as being something that isn't just 
a, a nebulous other, but something that can be sort of integral to a life experience, anybody's life experience. And um, so that that got me thinking about the importance of sort of the plein air movement that's happening right now, because if you're a plein air painter and you've been outdoors, um, you know, we have countless conversations with people that, um, like my husband, you know, didn't see art as being sort of an integral part or something that they can connect with. Um, you know, they don't, maybe they don't go to galleries or museums when they travel or in their, in their hometown, but here they've come upon an artist painting in their hometown, something that they identify with. Um, I was just out painting on a farm here in Easton and this uh, guy, that, the young guy that works on the farm came by and couldn't imagine that I could find anything interested, interesting to paint. And I'm like, what? Are you crazy? Look at all this. You know, look at all this great stuff. It just felt like a candy land to me. And um, so I think we may be giving people their first art experience in a lot of ways. And I then, think that's a huge observation and, and really ties into this whole concept of the plein air force the idea of we, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, there, there's, I don't know, there's a half a million people now listening to this podcast or some crazy number. And, and oh, why? Hi, I mean, and, 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 and why is Plein Air Magazine, of all the, all the art and photography magazines in Barnes & Noble, mm-hmm. why is Plein Air Magazine the number one in, in the category? And yeah. it, so there's something about this movement and it's bringing so many people in. I mean, I, 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 you know, we had, we had 200 people show up at the plein air convention last year who had never painted before, did their first painting, mm-hmm. first plein air painting, first painting ever, uh, bought their materials there. And uh, mm-hmm. I, th- I think you're onto something. I think this is something that's really critically important because, right. you know, especially because we're not, we're not getting art in the schools anymore. And when I was a uh, kid, you know, we had an art class we had to go to, but there is no art class for most kids anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it makes art accessible in a way that is very, um, it, you know, that the viewer is very connected to. So, and then if they buy their first piece, you know, they have a story on their wall, not just a painting. Right. They, they, they have a, and this is the place that she painted and this is a conversation that I had and I know this artist. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a great opportunity. And, and Eric, I also think that there's, um, I hope that time will tell that there's a historical aspect of this too, because, you know, you, there are things that we are painting that in 10, 15, 20 years won't be there anymore or they'll be significantly different and we will have recorded that, um, so it, it feels like a privilege in some ways too. Well, it's a, it's you know there are there are groups and organizations around the country, plein air groups who who specifically focus on preservation of at least the memory of the lands that are about to get developed. You know that's happened a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Dan Pinkham has a group out west in the Pacific Palisades area, which has basically gone out and documented all this land, which since got developed. And so um, yeah, I think that's very, very important for all of us. You know, there's so many different things that we can do as a a collective group of people who, you know, who love what we do. We, we can help mm-hmm. people discover art. I was I ran into an art dealer yesterday um and we were talking about how people um, aren't buying a lot of uh, the historic art anymore, and uh, that the only people buying it are over forty-five. And I was thinking about, you know, how do we solve that problem? How do we, how do we find mm-hmm. a way that we can get people engaged and help them understand that there's more to art than abstract art or Banksy? You know, that there are other options for them. Not being critical of those things, just saying, hey, you know, mm-hmm. what we do matters too. Um, so I, I like, I like where you're going with this. What are you going to do about it? (laughs) Well, I'm going to keep painting. (laughs) You know, one of the things that these events are doing is they, uh, and many of them are having this sort of, uh, Easton's going to have a small painting Sunday where every artist, all 58 or so of us have done a six by eight. So it's sort of a way for people that, um, you know, want to sort of, buy their first piece can sort of easily come in and 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 have their first piece of artwork and i think that that's a real accessible way to get 
get people collecting and thinking about themselves as collectors and and having something that isn't just another tchotchke on their wall or a print, um, yeah, but is is a piece of of artwork. You know, and I and I um, first time I ever went to a home. Uh, this I'm not trying to make this about me. I apologize, but it's to the point. I went to mm-hmm. the home of Kristen Teese, who's an art dealer um, who mm-hmm. manages Richard Schmid. And Kristen's home was filled with art. It's the first home I ever visited that was all original art. And there was something about that house that was just spectacular. It was the art that made, made it spectacular. And, yeah. um, it, you know, sometimes it just takes that first piece, you know, one entry. Because I, I think that people find art intimidating. And, you know, they think it's expensive. And sometimes it is, of course. But they, they don't necessarily think it's for them. And once they get that little tiny original in their home, then they're going to love that so much they're going to probably want more. Right. Right. I, I, I was out at um, the Olmsted Plein Air in the spring, and somebody was asking me about another artist piece, a piece by Jill Basham, and he asked me what I thought about the piece. And I said, well, you know, Jill's a terrific artist. If, you know, if, if you love the piece, then buy it. You know, it, there's not an artist here who isn't, here because they deserve it. I don't think I said that right. Every artist there deserves to be there. They're all great artists. And if you love that piece, then you're going to love it five years from now. And and he went on to buy it. And I think that was his first um, painting purchase. Yeah, you know, the, I, the other yeah, you, piece you of advi- about, the other piece of advice for that is buy it fast. Because how, how right? many times have you regretted not buying something you saw and somebody else grabbed it? Right, right, and. I, I had an experience in um, Ed Door County. Um, they have one of the best uh, quick paint auctions of, of the events in the country. And, and this one year, a woman bought my piece, and she said that the previous year, she had sort of set a, a limit for herself, like she would pay X amount of dollars for. And, and the piece that she wanted um, got over that amount and ended up selling for $200 over what she thought her limit was and she said she regretted it all year you know that she just you know because she would have forgotten about the two hundred dollars and just had that that piece that she so identified with so it it was nice that then she decided well you know she was going to get my piece (laughs) so i was pleased about that but but it's it's a good point and i think one that they ought to tell at those those auctions more often (laughs) so we've talked a lot about uh you and the in the uh, the movement and, and a lot of things that happened in, in your career. Let's talk a little bit about technique because I, I think that some people like to hear a little bit about that. Um, do you have a particular area that you would consider to be an expertise that, um, that you could really help people in? Well, when I began teaching, I, you realize, you know, any artist that's been at it a while you realize that you sort of have this backpack or toolbox of knowledge that you're just sort of, um, you know, it feels like intuition now, sort of like typing, like your fingers know where to go. And when I began to teach, you have to sort of back up and think, okay, what was I taught and what is now sort of commonplace to me that now I can put into words so that I can relay the same information to someone else. Um, you know, there there are certain things that are just sort of basic fund of knowledge that if you've taken a drawing course or a color theory course, um, you sort of know and you move on from, but then you have all these people taking your workshops that, that don't know those things. And um, so I've, I've put a lot of effort into um, how I can teach color theory or how, you know, how light behaves so that you can begin looking for it and and predicting it and making decisions on what you know. Um, you know how that relates to value and mixing paint. Um, you know, in in my workshops too, I also talk about um, toning and you know why you might use that and why you might choose different ways to do it. Um, I try to. I, I try to sort of lay out all of these. Uh, your um, your interview with Joe Paquette a number of weeks ago was just excellent, and he 
he has this, you know, this pyramid of mastery where it, there are all these things that sort of need to sort of come together. And as you move up the pyra- pyramid, so does your mastery. And um, it can feel both daunting um, and also challenging in that, you know, how, how good is your drawing? How well do you understand composition? Um, color, value is color, um, design, um, expression, something that often gets left out of um, representational work. You know, does it have a voice or a motif or an expression? And um, if you, if a student can sort of rate themselves, um, you know, ha- then they can sort of identify, okay, this is what I, I would like to be working on, understanding value better, understanding color better. So I try to get students to sort of identify where their weak points are, where their strengths are. And then um, when I get around to their easel, we'll sort of have that conversation of, you know, what are your goals and what are, you know, what are you learning rather than just assuming that the path that I'm taking them on in a workshop is the one that they need exactly. Yeah. Customized Um, makes a lot of sense. And you've just done, uh, you've just shot a new video. I did, yeah, yeah. And, and we're sort of keying in on that color theory and and what's happening with light and um, showing some images that Claude Monet did and, and how he used light. And, um, yeah, I, I hope that I can break down things. Um, my my husband came to Maui with me cause, because he's no idiot, and, <laughs> uh, and we're on this hike um, during the Maui plein air, and, and I point to the sort of – reflected puddle with a shadow spilling across it and I say what color is that shadow and he says gray and I'm like wrong like how can you have been married to me for 24 years and you think that that color is gray but as I began to explain it to him you know he began to see it I I hope now he's walking around squinting on the you know out in the field as a mechanical engineer looking at all these colorful shadows (laughs) I'm sure that's exactly what he's doing but well, in, in terms of um, uh, any particular techniques for beginners, any anything else that you'd like to share that might be helpful in terms of, you talked about drawing, you talked about values, any, anything else that they need to be focusing on? Um, you know, just doing. The, um, just you know, get Edgar out Payne there. calls talent, yeah, just get out there. Edgar Payne calls talent embryonic, meaning... You know, it's not much use isolated apart from disciplined, you know, getting out and doing. And one thing that I like to suggest is just find a group, um, sign up for for workshops, because I I like to joke that you're paying me to force you to paint for a week because (laughs) you're, you know, painting all day and you just you get better when you do. It's that um, it's that 10,000 hour rule, right, where you know, the people that practice more that, um, you know, those, those things that, um, like typing, you know, become second nature. Um, and, and just expect that you're going to have a lot of paintings that make better Frisbees than they make paintings and that, (laughs) and that just be okay with that, (laughs) that it is, it's part of the, the process. And, you know, I, I don't know, I know plenty of professional, you know, great artists that have wipeouts and scrape outs and, you know, we all do it. And, and actually if you haven't wiped out and scraped out, then it probably means you're just not painting enough. Very important lesson not to fall in love with your work. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. Yeah, and, and, Right. And when, and when you do, it's just going to be a couple of years before you're not so in love with it anymore because you've, you know, you maybe moved on. I can think of three three paintings that I wouldn't change, you know, from my from my past that I still look at and like. And um, that's yeah. pretty. That's a pretty high number, actually. Is it? Yeah. Well, maybe I lied. Maybe it's just two. <laughs> well, even t- even two. You know, I was telling somebody the other day. I walked into a gallery that uh, the gallery that I'm in right now, and. I cringed when I saw a couple of things. I thought, ah, oh, take them down. And yeah. then this woman said, oh, that's my favorite painting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. this has been fascinating. I, I, um, 
I, I really am happy that you've been a guest on this show and to, um, uh, you're doing such beautiful work and, and being part of the plein air community, getting out there and doing these, these shows. 14 is an awful lot. That's, that's a yeah, big commitment. Yeah. So, well, I, I feel very, very blessed. And, and, uh, if I can say one other thing, of I, course, another, um, big uh, thing I've been thinking about for a number of years, but just more profoundly here lately is I, I watched a, um, I think it was a BBC documentary on the Bronte sisters, um, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne. And um, in the history of ever, in the history of this planet, you know, I, I just, I, I feel like I, I may be just one of the most blessed people. I, you know, here, here they were living 160 years ago, um, by the the time the one that lived the longest, which was um, was Emily, I think, uh, you know, by the time she was my age, she had been dead nine years, and she had to ride as a man, and um, and I think here, you know, here I am, and I am, you know, traveling across the country, doing something that I love, um, with the full support and um, cheering on of my husband, and I am, you know, signing my my name as a woman and pricing my work the same as my male peers. And, and I, I just think, you know, in, in the history of, of the whole planet, you know, I, I just feel very blessed and very fortunate to um, be doing this with my life. So I like to pay it forward when I can. And uh, I guess that's it. Well, that's very good. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much for being on the show and for uh, all your contributions. Well, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. And thanks for all you do for the art community. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. Well, again, thanks to Susie Baker. Always learn a lot from these folks. So thank you, Susie. Well, in the Marketing Minute, I answer questions uh, that you've sent in. If you have a question, send it to eric at plenairmagazine.com. I'll answer your marketing questions. So the idea is to help you figure out how to sell your art or get more money for your art. Here's a question from Nikki Neinheis of Golden, Colorado. Nikki, thank you for this. Uh, her question is, what's a collector's pain point? What problem does art solve generally? I think that is coming from some of the things that I've taught in my book, which is in marketing, you want to solve problems. You want to try to find out what the problems are and then offer solutions to those problems. That's a standard marketing tenet. But in art, it's a little bit different because you can't really know what a collector's pain point is because everybody's got different pain points. But more importantly, they have emotional triggers. So let me give you an example. My sister-in-law has a painting that I gave her. It hangs in the foyer of her home. Everybody who comes in says, oh, I know that spot. I remember doing something there when I was a kid. And they all tell us the spot. And of course, it's not the real place it was painted. But it means something different to everybody, which is a sign of a good painting, at least, I hope. But also, you want something that's stimulating emotion. I was showing a picture online of a painting that a friend of mine did to my dad because it reminded me of my grandfather's house. And when he saw it, he said, yeah, that's my, my great grandfather's house. And he started talking about his memories there. And he kind of welled up. He said, you know, this painting really captures it. Well, it wasn't a painting of that actual house, but it was a house that looked like it. So I bought that for him for Father's Day because I thought it would be a cool thing. And he hangs it in his house, and it's a, a wonderful memory for him. So art injects emotional uh, positives, uh, memories, usually positives. Um, you know, it's kind of what makes somebody's house a home. It's, you know, surrounding them with personal reminders. And so you want to learn how to tell the story of your painting, uh, what you were thinking, where you were, but you want to leave a little bit open for fantasy so people can kind of insert their own message into it because a painting may mean something. I sold one painting to a lady. She came up and she said, oh, that reminds me of my time when I used to kayak on that river with my dad. And she bought it. She had tears in her eyes. Another lady walked up and she said, oh, that reminds me of something else. And, you know, it just, it reminds people. So you, you want to then, you know, tell them what the painting means to you and not necessarily take them off their story. 
But uh, that's why it's nice to be able to actually interact with collectors. But I also try to write up the stories of my paintings, stick them on the back of the painting so people know what they are. Like, you know, I painted this painting when I was out with Joe McGurl in Maine, and we had a great time, and, you know, here's what we were talking about or thinking about, you know. But I also talk about what the painting means to me, and then hopefully it'll have some emotional meaning to them. So solving the problem isn't easy Collector's pain points are not exactly easy to understand, but you do want to trigger emotions. Nikki also had a second question, so I'm going to use her second question for today, and that is how do you sell directly from your website and still work positively with your gallery? Well, if you have a gallery, you the very first thing you've got to do is have communication with them about what they feel is acceptable and not acceptable, and then you have to decide if that's acceptable to you. If they say, look, we don't want you selling direct on your website, then you need to be willing to honor that because they're putting a lot of money into marketing you and giving you wall space and trying to sell your paintings. And you certainly don't want somebody coming direct to you and buying direct from you if they've seen your work in the gallery. And so if that happens, I've been known to give a commission to the gallery even though the gallery didn't stimulate it. And so you just, you know, and, and by the way, it, it was just a picture I posted on Instagram. Somebody contacted me, found my information, contacted me, wanted to buy the paintings. And so it was the right thing to do to give the commission to the gallery. So you want to have a discussion with the gallery. Some artists I know have certain size points, like one artist I know says, okay, I want to get involved in the daily painting thing. So he sells uh, inexpensive paintings under 8 by 10 but the rest of the stuff he sends to the gallery and he doesn't put those up on his website, or if he does, he puts where they're available at what gallery. So you want to make sure that you're coordinating and working with the gallery. If you're not in a gallery, uh, it's not anything you need to worry about until the point at which you go into a gallery. Anyway, that's the Marketing Minute. Thank you for your questions. Send them in to me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Today's podcast was sponsored by Fall Color Week. I hope you'll come. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's the only time we're going to the Canadian Rockies, as far as I know. So you can learn more at fallcolorweek.com. And also, come to the Plein Air Convention. See Joe McGurl and lots and lots of other amazing, amazing people. We've got Joe Zavorbik. I think I've got his name right. He's uh, the greatest watercolorist in the world. He's coming in. He's also doing a pre-convention workshop. We're going to paint in San Francisco and wine country. Uh, very wonderful, beautiful areas. Paint the Golden Bay. Great. <laughs> paint the Golden Gate Bridge and other such beautiful sites. Grab your seat now while you can. It is selling fast. It's going to be probably the most popular location we've ever done. And we are going to run out of space like we always do. So uh, get your seats. You don't want to miss painting in San Francisco. We've got it totally under control. You're going to have a great time. Just check it out at plenairconvention.com. Last but not least, Sunday coffee. It's a thing I do every week. Uh, it's kind of about life. You get it on Sunday morning. If you want to check it out, read a couple and then maybe subscribe. Coffeewitheric.com. That's coffeewitheric.com. It's always fun to do this. Let's do it again sometime like next week. We'll see you then. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and the founder of Plen Air Magazine. And remember, go out there and do some painting. It's a big world. It needs you to do paintings. Bye-bye. <laughs>